Good evening and welcome to Your Health, Your Action. I'm Cassandra Crawford, your presenter for this evening's program, the second in the series, where we look forward to sharing information with you as we tackle at a national level the chronic non-communicable disease situation. We started the program last Wednesday, of course, with a focus on hypertension. And this week, we continue with hypertension. This time, uh, not so much looking at the behavioral change specifically, but we focus more on living with the complications of the disease. You'll get to hear from a number of partners because certainly as we try to tackle the situation of non-communicable diseases, we have to remember that it's a team effort. There's a lot of support that is involved. Uh, we hope that you will stay with us for the next hour and uh, you will engage. We want your questions. We've already gotten some questions submitted to us and we thank you for that. We want you to remember you can also do so via all the social media platforms. Uh, we are streaming online and of course you can call us here at the CBC 228-5562 or 228-5563. Remember that uh, this being a national effort, it's being streamed uh, not only uh, live online but we're also broadcasting on the radio services of the CBC as well as the Starcom network. Again, partnering to make sure that the message is shared. Uh, David Ellis isn't with us this evening. He will join us again next week when we look at yet another chronic non-communicable disease. We will turn our attention to diabetes. But if you've been paying attention to the situation, this dire situation, you know that hypertension and diabetes are somewhat intertwined in many ways. So today we're looking forward to sharing some stories from persons who have been impacted by hypertension as well as hearing from an interventional cardiologist. So since I've mentioned her. Her name is Dr. Dawn Scantlebury and we look forward to hearing her contribution this evening. She works quite closely with the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados. We will also hear from Melanie Buga, an occupational therapist. Uh, we will hear from Dr. Kathy Ellis. She is a family physician and uh, she also works closely with a number of persons who are impacted uh, by renal conditions, kidney disease. Uh, so we will be happy to hear from her. We have the nutritionist on board, thanks to the National Nutrition Center. Marianne Burnham joins us this evening as well. So we are very happy to have you joining us here, uh, ladies, on your health, your and to stay healthy. So it was just a shock to me when it happened. I didn't even realize at first that I was having a heart attack. After the heart attack and coming to the uh, heart and Stroke Foundation, was there any further modification of your lifestyle that they would have recommended? Of course. They recommend that you exercise and you eat more fruits and vegetables, which I, I probably needed to eat more than what I was doing before. Yeah. So that brings me now to your daughter. And, uh, what brings you to the Heart and Stroke Foundation? Uh, as a preventative measure, because I know my mom, what she went through, so just trying to keep healthy and stuff so that it won't happen to me. What's your routine when you come here? Uh, I, I, come to, I try to come twice a, twice a week, and I go on the treadmill, warm up first, and then anything else after that. You must warm up first. What else do they put you through as a preventative measure? Um, well, they had a personal trainer in here, and she, she brought up a, a schedule for me um, to follow. So that was really it, and then the diet. They, they asked me what I was eating and stuff, and what to eat. They suggested them what I should eat. Then. How challenging has it been for you to change your lifestyle? Mm -hmm. It isn't challenging, actually. I, I, I love coming because of the results that I have been getting since I started, so I, I'm going to continue. How long ago did you start? Um, just before COVID. I had a heart attack um, three months ago. I was here for the last well, five weeks. Yeah. Share with me that experience of the heart attack. Well, it was rather surprising for me because I'm usually in the gym, I work out, I eat properly. Um, but I was feeling rather stressed, to be quite honest. And 
I was doing some work at home. I felt a pain. I didn't associate it with a heart attack. I just thought that it was me because of what I was doing. But then when I realized I wasn't feeling any better, I went to the doctor who told me that she didn't like what she was seeing. Um, I had to go to the hospital. How were you feeling? Uh, apart from the pain in the chest, which was just like a tightness, I wasn't really feeling anything, to be quite honest. Um, I just felt normal, but just had a pain. You were hypertensive? Pre-hypertensive, yeah. My blood pressure would normally be like 130 over, say, 82, 85. How long has that been so? Mm, the past few years, I would say, well, past four years or so, yeah. So after the heart attack, you've come to the Heart and Stroke Foundation. What has that been like? What kind of changes have you been asked to make? Um, well, my changes I did for me. I haven't met with the um, nutritionists yet, but I just try to readjust my diet to what it used to be, be before. Low sodium, low sugar, that sort of thing. But well, say since I came here, um, I've been feeling a lot better and a lot stronger um, than I was um, just after the heart attack. Again, those conversations with persons impacted by the complications of hypertension are critical, and we're seeing that they're actually going through their rehabilitation process. So I want to start by hearing from, uh, well, this is the nutritionist. We're going to hear from Marianne very shortly as well, uh, but we're going to hear from the occupational therapist first. Uh, Ms. Buga, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. So, so let's, let's talk about that part of the journey right there. When stroke or assistance of a therapist, what is that process like? Okay, so I will guide you through the two avenues that I am more familiar with. So when people present to the Acidan Emergency Department at QEH, they are, if they are admitted, um, if they had a stroke, they would be admitted to the stroke unit if there is space on that ward. And on the stroke rehabilitation unit, there is a team, and I am a member of that team. So there is occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, uh, physiatry, which is a specialty of medicine, uh, rehabilitative medicine. And there is also the consultant neurologist. Once the patient, is on the stroke unit. The referral to the rehabilitation team is automatic. So each member of the team would do an assessment and then based on the patient's deficits, we would then start the rehabilitation there. There are cases where persons are not admitted to the hospital and they go directly back to the community. Um, in that regard, it would be outpatient rehabilitation where the person would come back to the clinics, wherever that may be. If that is at the hospital or a private clinic in the community, people go sometimes once or twice a week and they engage with their therapist there. And the goals of the sessions are based on the person's deficits. So there, they could be um, mild deficits, like uh, I say mild quote unquote, with uh, challenges with balance, to as severe as not being able to use one side of their body, not being able to swallow, not being able to speak, um, not being able to know where they are, what their name is, that type of thing. So um, cognitive rehab is also something that the occupational therapist and the speech therapist um, specialize in. And that rehab is quite long and intensive as you would anticipate because you are basically retraining the brain function from a very impaired level to the person being able to re-engage in their desired daily activities. So that could be as simple as being able to brush your teeth to as complex as returning to your role as a teacher or an attorney or a judge. So though the rehabilitative process is quite lengthy, 
Um, and it is a team effort, so I don't work independently. A team effort on your end as well as team effort with the family, I would imagine. Um, what, what is the age range like in terms of the cases presenting themselves to you and your team? Uh, so in the last few years, we've seen the age lower. Um, so the average is between, I would say, 40 and about 72. And so in, historically, when we first started on the street, on the short rehabilitation unit, which was about seven years ago, we would see much older people presenting with strokes, mm -hmm. um, people in their late 70s, 80s. Um, but in the, recent, um, in the recent past, we've been seeing those ages um, drop. We've actually had cases with persons younger than 35 present with strokes, um, and some of them not having uh, severe predisposing factors. Uh, such as uncontrolled high blood pressure or diabetes. It, not having those those factors, you're saying you. you no. So, can are you in a position to say some of the the causes or? I am not qualified to ask that. Okay, <laughs> all right, understood. But that is that is a very interesting point that you've shared with us there. So I think uh, we will chat some more with you, but I wanted to give people a sense of what that process is like once someone has been affected by a stroke as a result of hypertension. And we're hearing uh, that sometimes they don't even have uh, the risk factors, the usual risk factors that you would expect to hear, and the age is dropping. So younger persons being impacted definitely a concern and this is why we're here to make sure that we can get as many of the answers share as much of the information and engage you so keep your questions handy get them ready and feel free to send them to us let's also uh, bring in uh, dr kathy lewis and uh, marianne burnham at this point in time uh, Dr. Dr. Kathy Ellis, rather. Dr. Ellis is a family physician, but Dr. Ellis, I want to give you an opportunity, first of all, uh, who, who have uh, some of these complications of hypertension. All right, so good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am, as you said, I'm a family physician. So I see patients at the primary care level who end state um, there are a host of factors, hypertension. Some patients may have congenital abnormalities of the kidneys or various infections um, or other chronic illnesses like diabetes, autoimmune illnesses, which actually attack the kidneys and cause the end stage renal disease. So we see patients um, on, the dia on dialysis because of that. And um, we can have patients as we've had patients certainly on my unit from as young as in their teens, so you're sort of 18 years old. Um, and those patients are usually because of, say, congenital um, problems with the kidneys, and which may have then led to hypertension in their youth and or autoimmune illnesses. As I said, those are really the more common reasons for in the younger age group. But in the older patients, most of them would have a history of hypertension, diabetes, or um, another autoimmune illness. All right. What what is usually your advice when you you make a diagnosis or you are seeing someone, a patient who you know now understands that this is what they're dealing with? What is usually your advice, or what is usually their biggest concern or biggest challenge? I think the advice, and this is not. Um, something that I'm sure people will not be hearing for the first time is usually to address the lifestyle changes um, first of all. So if patients are are overweight, we advise them to, to lose weight. If the patients have um, a history of poor eating habits, we certainly ask them to address their diet. That's where someone like Marianne comes in. And again, mm -hmm. it's a team effort. So you can refer them to a dietitian or discuss certainly simple things like just reducing the salt content um, reducing things like of your food choices in terms of fast foods and that sort of thing. Know what you're eating. Um, encourage patients to prepare their meals so they actually know what's in it. If you are not preparing your food, then you don't know. It tastes great, but you don't know why it tastes great. You know, it might taste this way because it's got certain things in it. So try to encourage people to be a part of their meal planning. And 
exercise is crucial for anyone, even if you have no chronic illnesses. So that's always at the advice of a of family physician. Yes. Sh everyone should be having exercise. We try to encourage five, at least five days a week, at least for 30 minutes. Um, but if you aim for that, at least if you fall below that, that's what you should be trying to aim for. And if you are a smoker, stop smoking. One cigarette is too much. So there's absolutely no room for smoking. And if you um, are someone who drinks alcohol, then we advise you to reduce the alcohol intake. And so certainly those first, what we call just the lifestyle changes, is the first step towards addressing most of the NCDs. And certainly hypertension is not um, any different. Okay, I want you to note uh, that there are people who will say, well, listen, movement is a problem for me. Some people um, have compounded situations. They may, it may be difficult for, their, for them to move around. Mobility may be an issue. So I want you to deal with the, the ways they can move, uh, things you, you recommend to persons who may have concerns about that. Uh, but I also want to bring in uh, Marianne Burnham at this point in time because we keep hearing about the importance of the right diet coming back. So as the nutritionist, this is your opportunity to help that person who's been diagnosed or maybe predisposed with, uh, to hypertension to understand why it's important, why diet is so important, and to make it a real lifestyle change. All right, and good night, Cassandra and everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, diet is key. Diet is key. Um, in terms, well, I can start telling you what not to eat because mm -hmm. a lot of people, um, I see people in polyclinics, people who have had strokes or heart attacks and are coming to me as a follow-up as well, are people who are just, um, curious about how to eat with their hypertension condition. What is common in terms of their diets is a lot of high salt stuff. So the hot dogs, the lunch and meat, the nuggets, uh, all the corned beef, you know, they're typical morning fare. The lunch time, uh, people usually buy a lot of lunch and people usually cook with a lot of OXO and Maggie cubes so that the the, food the MSG needs have, to go. The MSG, yes, the MSG and the sodium in the OXO, Maggie, or whatever brand of flavor cube. Um, lots of people cook with those and eat that type of food. And then in the evening, you might have a little something again, maybe a little lunch of meat and biscuit. So when, I, when people talk to me, I just hear salt, 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 salt. So how do we have, how do we continue now without all of this salt? In the first first things on morning to have to remove all of the processed meats you know people usually ask me so then what do i eat i'm not eating hot dogs i'm not eating lunch of meat they're telling me to stop nuggets so what do i eat there's egg there's tuna and tuna in water and lower salt tuna and there's sardine lower salt you, sardine you as well there. <laughs> the water <laughs> all right yes. mm -hmm. i mean you can have these things in chicken water. strips you can have your chicken strips, you know, some of them would have some additional sodium, but still it's a better option. A chicken strip or the chicken chunks are way better than the chicken nuggets. Yes. Really and truly, because they actually have actual chicken in them and not the other stuff that um, tends I'm to I'm talking be about chicken breast, you know, chicken breast, the strips that you cut up yourself and you right. put some thyme and marjoram on it. Which is, which is good, but I see that the supermarket has no uh, a brand of um, chicken. Well, the same chicken strips or uh, oh. the chicken chunks, and people might still resort to that So because it's convenient. So it's not bad. You still have to watch the sodium in it. It's still better than the nuggets. So mm -hmm. that's how I encourage people. You know, So at lunchtime, I would say prepare your lunch. But people are going to say, I'm busy, I have so many kids, you know, I, I go to school, etc. But you have to be mindful of the source that you buy your, your food from, what's in the food. You know, are you having rice and pie and all these things together? You really have to ask what's in the food. And also, the vegetables are key. You know, do people have vegetables with their cooked food every day? People usually mm -hmm. tell me, I just have vegetables on Sundays. And that is a big issue here in Barbados. And those are just some of the ways we usually eat. Veg, uh, you would have your vegetables on Sundays. The other days of the week, you eat you eat corned beef and rice and and lunch and meat and other things just to get through the week. But you have your main meal that's most nutritious. On you really do need to get away from that. 
Okay. All right. So that sounds good. And this is a diet that would also work for persons who are living after having had a heart attack or stroke, mm. all these things that you have said. Um, so, so remind persons, because we've been flashing it there, how a plate should really look if you're doing it the right way. No processed well, foods, we've got that. Correct, correct. You have to include your fruits and vegetables, however you include your fruits and vegetables. I never said to sit down and eat four mangoes one time. It is the season Shoot. now, I never said so. Right, I'm so sorry, Cassandra. Um, but you need to include a variety of fruits and vegetables as a natural snack, not the low fruit snacks and things that the parents often buy for their kiddies as well. I'm not talking about those fruit snacks, I mean actual fruits. You know, you might say that the vegetables are pricey, you try to buy what's in season, do what you have to do there. But your plate, what your plate should look like, I, I saw that the people here at CBC had the plate model up. Mm -hmm. um, your plate should be half veg or half fruits and veg. If you're looking at a nine inch plate, half of that plate should be fruits and veg. Quart of the plate, like the size of my fist, a quart of the plate should be the starch. And, a, and the other quart of the plate should be the protein. About the, the inside of your palm should be your chicken, fish, or other lean type of protein that you're there we having. Go. And we don't always have to have animal protein. Remember, we have peas and beans. Aha, that is it right there. Mm -hmm. So half of the plate, non-starchy vegetables. The quart of the plate, the carbohydrate foods. You know, your rice, sweet potato, yam, cassava, etc., And then your protein foods on that other quarter. And that's very simple and straightforward. A uh, simple and straightforward way for us to start to eat. Majority of us have a lot of carbohydrate on our plate. So half of our plate is usually actually the carbohydrate. And that runs us in trouble with overweight and excess fat, etc., you know those types of things so we really really need to start to cut down on the amount of carbohydrate we eat we're not and lifting weights we're not running marathons we don't eat all of that carb which yeah. is a traditional way for us to eat and it's important to know that because some people will say well i got carrots and i have uh, squash and that's and then they go and they still have their breadfruit or rice or whatever carrots mm -hmm. And, and squash, Do, aren't those also considered starchy vegetables? Because, yeah, let's, let's make sure that people understand the balance of vegetables, um, the types of vegetables the they should carrots, push. The cut carrots and pumpkin would be like um, starchy vegetables. So vegetables that, are that, that, that have in some degree of carbohydrate in mm -hmm. them. So if we decide that we're eating a big setup, if we've chosen carrot and pumpkin and similar foods and have them as our vegetable portion, that really adds to our starch portion. Right. And then they will increase your blood sugar. So I'm not really talking about those types of vegetables. If you have it, if you have in pumpkin and carrot on your plate, you don't need as much rice or you don't yes. need as much potato or Correct. you don't need as much sweet potato. You can cut your carbohydrate portion because you're having starchy vegetables. I think that squash exists in the non-starchy vegetables, so you can get okay. away with your squash. But when we say vegetables, we're not, you know, I know that ground provisions are vegetables too, but when we're talking about vegetables, we talk about your greens, we talk about your cucumber, your spinach, your kale, beans. your lettuce, beans, yes, beans. So those are the types of foods that we are talking about when we say right. vegetables. Because Let's pause here, Marianne. That starts with our vegetables. Mm -hmm. Very good information. We're going to talk some more on the other side of nine o'clock right now. We're going to pause for lotteries. We'll continue with your health, your action after this. I know you like your rice and pork, but I wish you would eat more vegetables. Sweetheart, why do you worry so much about what I eat? I worry because you have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. The World Health Organization says that people with NCDs are more likely to become severely ill if they get COVID-19. What? And now that you're only working three days a week, you're spending more time on the sofa, watching TV, drinking soft drinks. So how is eating like that? going to help me. These times are so stressful. Just let me enjoy myself. 
Vegetables are high in vitamins, minerals, and fiber to help maintain your weight and control your blood pressure. A healthy diet helps to keep your immune system strong and protect you from diseases. I know you really care about my health, hon, and I really appreciate it. Look, I'm going to have some vegetables. Can I have a glass of water, please? Wait, you wash your hands? Hello? Hi, Grace, me. Hey, Cheryl. Girl, uh, I can't talk to you right now. I'm doing my morning exercise. Babe? Since when is your morning exercise so important? Since the World Health Organization say that people with NCDs are more likely to get real sick if they catch COVID-19. What? Yes, you know I'm a diabetic. Plus, I put on a little size. So I got to exercise and use up this little bit of energy that I got to keep my blood sugar under control. Plus my doctor say that when I exercise, it will help to keep my immune system strong. Oh, so God forbid, if you ever get COVID, you have a better chance of recovering faster. Exactly. Grace, I never told you that I have high blood pressure. I don't even take the medication properly. I look and got to join you in your morning so exercise or the line dancing. What do you think? Yes, and I can send you the same routine that I'm doing here now, girl. It's real sweet. Hon, I know you like your rice and pork, but I wish you would eat more vegetables. Sweetheart, why do you worry so much about what I eat? I worry because you have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. The World Health Organization says that people with NCDs are more likely to become severely ill if they get COVID-19. What? And now that you're only working three days a week, you're spending more time on the sofa, watching TV, drinking soft drinks. So how is eating like that going to help me? These times are so stressful. Just let me enjoy myself. Vegetables are high in vitamins, minerals, and fiber to help maintain your weight and control your blood pressure. A healthy diet helps to keep your immune system strong and protect you from diseases. I know you really care about my health, hon, and I really appreciate it. Look, I'm going to have some vegetables. Can I have a glass of water, please? Wait, you wash your hands? Welcome back to Your Health, Your Action. So much to share. The question is always, do we have enough time? But we encourage you to join us and send your questions in advance for each Wednesday evening. Uh, this week, of course, we are dealing with hypertension. Once again, the complications of the disease. We had a caller uh, before we took the pause for lotteries. Uh, do we still have that caller? Yes, hello, good night. Hi, good evening. Go ahead with your question quickly. I'm, so we can I'm, I'm calling to ask a question pertaining to the fruits and vegetables like pear, cucumber, lettuce, spinach. What would you like to um, know about those? What amount, how much amount of it? Okay, like you sweep the heart and store with these games of blood clots and whatnot. What, how much? What does it do to develop 
for you to make it a blood that causes you then to have blood clots that can blood lead the heart or stroke. Okay. In terms um, of, and then in terms of mangoes and the drink stuff like beverages, what kind of thing that you can use or don't use or can use in more moderation. I heard a number of questions. Thank you so much, caller. Um, I heard a number of things there. Uh, blood clots and vitamin K and which, how much of, of specific vegetables and fruits can be used. I heard avocado, cucumber. I don't know what else I missed, but the call is falling in and out. Is it best for me to go to the cardiologist or should I go to the dietitian? Who, who takes that one? All right, I'll take it, Maria. Yeah. Dr. Scantlebury, good evening. Go ahead. Uh, so I'll answer that question about the um, vitamin P. Um, uh, that question is relevant to patients who are actually taking warfarin. Warfarin is a drug that uh, decreases the ability of your blood to clot. It acts by antagonizing the action of vitamin K-dependent clotting factors in your liver. Uh, so if you take a lot of vitamin K in your diet, it works against the action of warfarin. The converse is not true. If you take lots of fruits and vegetables that contain a lot of vitamin K, you do not um, clot any better than um, or, or any more avidly than if you are eating fewer um, fruits and vegetables that contain a lot of vitamin K. Um, so, you know, if you're eating fruits and vegetables, actually what happens is that you improve um, all of these systems within your body, within your liver, et cetera, that maintain good, um, uh, your, your, what we call your coagulation cascade um, versus the cascade that breaks down um, clots. It's a very um, complex way of saying eating fruits and vegetables keep your blood vessels and uh, and all of that healthy. So if unless you are on warfarin for an active blood clot, you should not worry about the vitamin K in, in fruits and vegetables. Then they should avoid these things. I'm I'm asking if they are Say indeed on if they are indeed on a, a warfarin regimen, oh. what should their actions right. be? So my recommendation usually to patients, um, previously people would tell patients avoid green leafy vegetables because they have large amounts of um, vitamin K, etc. My recommendation now is to just be consistent with the amount uh, because of just how healthy these things are. So obviously if we want patients to eat healthy and eat your fruits and vegetables and now we're telling them eat um, you know, eat less leafy green vegetables. It sounds um, uh, contradictory. So what I tell patients who are on warfarin, if you're going to eat a salad, a small salad every single day, eat it every single day because I need to know the dose of vitamin K that you're taking in to antagonize it, antagonize it with the dose of warfarin that you're taking. If you are taking a big salad today and nothing um, tomorrow, your warfarin levels um, or, or the levels of clotting are going to go all over the place. So just be consistent. Eat healthy and be consistent with the amount of vitamin K you take in. Yes, um, so I hope that that helps uh, your query caller. Uh, we had uh, another question submitted. Um, so let's uh, take a look at that and we'll have uh, the specialists, the, the health professionals respond accordingly. Uh, so we should have that on screen very shortly. It says, good evening, my granddaughter would not eat any fruits or vegetables, no matter how I try to cook them. I have even tried ice block smoothies. Any advice from the panel? I feel like uh, Marianne Burnham would be good for this one. What would you suggest? Well, that is a common problem with the young people. I usually try to encourage parents and grandparents to get the child, get the child, um, include the child in the process. Okay, so they really don't like to eat fruits and vegetables up in a, apart from hiding them in the food, which you might have to, to do to get them in. Ask the child, you know, what 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 fruit would you like to try today you pick the fruit you know you get the child involved in the process allow them to pick the fruit wash it allow them to peel it allow them to put it in the blender if you're going to blend it just include the child in the process 
you know so if this week we focuses on apples we're going to deal with apples and we can ha try to have an apple every day in a different way but you the, the child let the child pick the fruit or the vegetable pick the way that it's prepared and and um in and incorporate it into the food so it's their decision that they're making yes i would say hide the fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. in the food however you can but include them in the decision making and the cooking process and it would become a more inclusive activity and the child would eventually catch on yeah and we have to include them from as early as possible if we're looking to see yes. real change in the long term if we're talking about really beating this uh, chronic non-communicable disease situation but we'll have a special show for children uh, down the road as well another question before we share this next uh, clip with you uh, so we're trying to respond to the question submitted if a patient does not want to take clinical meds for hypertension is it advisable to supplement with natural herbs or alternative medicines let's go with uh, Dr. Ellis? So my advice, as I said initially, if your patient has hypertension, they need to incorporate all the lifestyle changes that we mentioned earlier. If, and depending on the numbers, and we, and every, everyone should know just how high their, their, their pressures are and discuss it with their doctors, then you need to make a plan of how you're going to, to address it if the lifestyle changes are not enough. Unfortunately, as medical practitioners, we, we do encourage people to have, you know, to make the, the lifestyle changes in terms of diet, incorporate um, healthy herbs in terms of seasoning their foods. In terms of prescribing herbs, that's not usually um, part of our training. However, if, and the, dif and the difficulty with prescribing herbs, because I mean, patients come to me and say, well, you know, I, if I drink parsley water and, and so on, mm -hmm. and the difficulty is that we can't say to you how much parsley, how often to take it, how strong does it need to steep in the water and so on, which is why the medication is what we prescribe because we know exactly what dose we're, we're given. We know how it should be taken, when it should be taken, and if we can control it better that way. If um, the patients are, are definitely not going to follow your advice, then you mm -hmm. still need to follow them up and see if what their measures are doing are actually bringing the numbers down to what you want. Because if they are doing something that is consistent, that is getting the results that you need, and it's something that is sustainable, then we can work with them. But what I would say is to continue to be in contact with your family physician. So you don't just go off and start doing things on your own and or, you know, telling us that you're taking the medication when you're not doing it. Because, Absolutely. you know, we need, everybody needs to be informed. So we're all part, of, as Marianne said, a big part of the decision making. If people are involved in the process, then they understand why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah, and I think it's, it's critical to, to be honest about what you're doing if you're, you were prescribed with medication because you don't know how they will interact either. So, so that's something exactly. you definitely want to make sure that your doctor is um, aware of so exactly. that you, you get the best care. And that's, that's all everybody wants. And uh, pull the family members in, make sure everybody knows what's going on. But as promised, uh, we have a, another clip that I promised to share with you. You heard from some patients who have been affected uh, by heart attack and one daughter who is trying her best to uh, stave any such uh, situation off. But we are also going to hear now from uh, David Ellis and his conversation with Dr. Scantlebury while she was there at the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados. These are clients, um, so that's Monday. Uh, Monday is heart cardiac day. So, so uh, these clients have all had some cardiac event mm -hmm. and they are now um, uh, exercising uh, under nurse monitoring and also telemetry monitoring. Telemetry um, is uh, it's kind of radio signals. They are hooked up to um, our heart tracing. You can see the, um, the you know the lines coming from their chest so we're actually doing electrocardiographic monitoring and that's sending signals to a central monitor so a nurse is monitoring uh, the patient's heart rate in their ECG as they exercise so um, if they have abnormal rhythms during exercise we pick it up immediately if they have um, if their heart rate is going too high um, for for their exercise prescription we, the nurse can then tell them you know you're going a little bit too much you just need to back off and uh, that's because post event um, as we uh, 
uh, try to get patients back to a, a good level of functioning, um, we have very, very regimented and protocolized uh, exercise um, uh, routines for, for patients. So you've had a heart attack um, or you have stable angina where you have chest pain um, at a certain level of exertion uh, because of the, the blockage. Um, we, you know, we exercise you to, to less than where you would get symptoms. Um, and as time goes by, you're actually able to, ex uh, to increase your exercise capacity. Um, sometimes as a cardiologist, I will refer patients who are not candidates for, for bypass surgery or for stents for exercise therapy, and exercise is their actual therapy. You know, they, um, we get people who have a whole bunch of symptoms coming in, and then at the end of it, they're able to go back to normal functioning because um, the, what exercise does, it increases blood vessel formation around the heart. Um, it creates what we call um, uh, collaterals, where uh, say you have a blockage, the heart actually does its, this sort of, um, thing where the, you, it creates blood vessels to bypass that blockage and improve the blood supply to the heart muscle downstream of where the blockage is. Um, so our exercise is actually crucial to the, the uh, management of um, heart disease. If more people become aware of this service, mm -hmm. then you, the, the size of this, uh, this particular place is, is limited. It's limited, it's very limited, but um, it's right now for the level of referrals we get, it's, it's uh, sufficient. I mean, we fluctuate up and down, and right now post-COVID um, or, or, or during COVID, um, our numbers are a lot lower than they used to be at one point. But even then, they were not, um, you know, based on what we were getting at the hospital compared to what we were getting over here, it's still a lot less. So. Um, you're right. We, we really, truly should have a significantly larger facility for the uh, amount of heart disease we have in Barbados. Um, think about cardiac rehab. If you go anywhere in the world, uh, there are all of the, the, there's always this disconnect between the amount of heart disease and the amount of patients coming, coming through a cardiac rehab program. And a lot of it is, well, unfortunately, as an interventional cardiologist, I, I understand where some people are thinking. They, they're thinking the fancy stent and the, the bypass surgery and all of these fancy things that we can do in, in first world medicine. And people forget the, the basics, the foundation of healthy lifestyles, exercise, nutrition, uh, good, you know, healthy eating, etc. People a lot of them forget that. They, they forget that, you know, once I've put a stent in somebody's coronary artery, they're still at risk of a heart attack in another blood vessel or even you know, downstream of where I put that stent because of progression of disease. That cholesterol plaque isn't um, going to disappear because I put a stent upstream. It's still going to continue if the patient continues to eat unhealthy, if they don't exercise, if they don't manage their blood pressure or diabetes. So that's where rehab comes in. That's where prevention comes in. This is we're focusing on secondary prevention and making sure that that patients are um, are properly equipped to help with self management of their chronic diseases. Some key words keep coming back at us. Good nutrition, exercise, these things keep coming back. And I want to come right back to you, Dr. Scantlebury, because this, this is serious. Is it safe to say that cardiac issues, um, this is one of the major complications of hypertension? Um, if we... Um if we think of what hypertension is, uh, hypertension is high pressure within the blood vessels of the heart, uh, uh, the blood vessels of the body. So you have your heart connected to the tube of the blood vessels. This is the heart, this is the blood vessel. And every time it squeezes, it has to squeeze against that high pressure. And um, 
every time the the blood goes through those blood vessels there's a high pressure that is exerted against the walls of the blood vessels so that the heart has to work a lot harder than it needs to to overcome that high pressure within the blood vessels it, um, the the walls can get thickened and over a period of time they can become weakened the blood vessels be they the, the major like the blood vessels like the aorta or the major arteries or even the smaller branch vessels and the arterioles because of the high pressure within them the walls can become damaged and over a period of time um, the healing process includes cholesterol plaque formation that's accelerated if you have diabetes if you have high cholesterol if you're a smoker um, and it's also increased if you have a family history of heart disease so when we look at statistics worldwide hypertension um, has the greatest attributable risk to the development of cardiovascular disease and follow it one more heart disease or cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death worldwide um, the number one cause of premature death so I, I get a lot of people th thinking about or saying well these are elderly people who are going to die anyway but when you look at premature death look at people dying before they were expected to it's still cardiovascular disease and hypertension is the number one cause of that okay so if, if we look at the list then of other spin-off complications what are some of the other things that you would say um, kidney disease, going back to Dr. Ellis's um, discussion about dialysis. So um, the kidneys are getting pummeled by hypertension every single beat, and um, they can become damaged over a period of time. Um, thing about patients with renal failure, if um, they don't go to dialysis, um, they can die from their, their kidney disease. But the again the most common cause of um, death and disability in in kidney failure patients is actually heart disease again and that's because kidney disease um, and and some of the complications that occur in patients who have renal failure um, uh, lead to accelerated cardiovascular disease so that's um, um, kidney disease stroke stroke is a cardiovascular disease eye disease um, so, you know, if you have hypertension, you can get um, what we call hypertensive retinopathy, and that can lead to difficulty with vision. Um, uh, I can go on and on, actually. Well, people but, need you know, to know, they need to understand so that we can really get people taking this seriously. Um, and then, you know, we come back around to, to the cardiovascular system. I, I guess the reason why we focus so much on it is that uh, hypertension of and by itself is a cardiovascular disease um, uh, because we're talking about the blood vessels and the pressure within the blood vessels. Um, so heart failure, which is a condition where the heart muscle is either thickened or it is weakened or both um, is a very common complication of hypertension. Uh, it leads to shortness of breath on exertion, shortness of breath at rest, fluid retention. Um, so we may see someone with leg swelling. Uh, they have difficulty um, lying down flat at night. Um, they have, um, they sometimes get them in the night, can't catch the breath because of the lungs filling up with fluid. Um, heart failure is also caused um, by by ischemic heart disease or blockages in the blood vessels that supply the muscle of the heart, which again, we, we know hypertension can lead to as well. Okay. Um, we, we, we need to pause and just take some questions from our viewers because we did ask them. So I have to, uh, the information is great, but I have to allow these questions. So um, as you see them come up, you can respond accordingly. This question is, can some blood pressure medications raise your blood sugar levels? Let's try to give them some um, concise as possible answers. Shall we go to Dr. Ellis for this? Okay, so this is not a common complication, um, but there may be an association with some of the older medications, not the newer medications. Okay. Uh, but certainly, again, it's just keep following. The people with high blood pressure should be closely monitored to make sure they don't like, develop any other chronic illnesses because they're predisposed to that as well. Right. So it's possible but not common. 
not common. All right. Um, I also got a question, and I'll do that one after this. What vegetables and fruits can I add to my diet to increase vitamin K consumption? I feel like we, we dealt with that, but go ahead, Marianne. Vitamin K consumption. Vitamin K is found in lots of green leafy vegetables and is also found in uh, things like uh, pumpkin. So if you eat your green leafy vegetables, if you eat your, your spinach and your kale and um, what? <laughs> running the beans again, the lettuce. Right. The spinach, kale, pumpkin, um, broccoli, mm -hmm. lettuce, collard greens. Uh, turnip greens, those types of foods Brock can choy? increase your vitamin K levels. Bok choy would be one of them, yes. Okay. That is high in vitamin K. All right. I hope that that has helped. Also, I got a question uh, that asked about what can be done to reduce cholesterol. Let me make sure. What are the ways to control cholesterol? And that plaque cholesterol Dr. Scantlebury just mentioned. Would you like to take that one, Dr. Scantlebury? What? Oh, Marianne, you said. Okay, Marianne, go ahead. <laughs> right, right. So the cholesterol, you know, starting with diet, we have to look at the amount of fiber that we are consuming. Mm -hmm. So fiber is, you know, the roughest you think that sends you to the bathroom, and fiber is found in your peas and beans, so your lentils, chickpeas, black beans, kidney beans, etc. Fiber is found in your sweet potatoes, your yam, your cassava. If you eat a baked potato and you eat the skin, that is also fiber. Fiber is found in your fruits and vegetables. So when you eat a mango, when you eat an apple, especially with the skin on, all of those are high fiber foods. In addition to your oats, barley, linseed, chia seeds. So fiber, there are several different forms available and several ways for us to make sure that we include it in our diet. So making sure that you include a fruit every morning, making sure that you choose a ground provision at lunchtime, making sure that you always choose whole wheat and bran bread versus white bread and you choose brown rice over white rice or you make sure you add your peas to your rice are very easy ways to get fiber sprinkling okay. in ground linseed and chia seed into your into something like pancakes is a way to um, increase your fiber intake forget the chocolate chips you can use Definitely not. <laughs> you can use chia seeds or blueberries um, I want to say thank you so much to you all time goes so quickly uh, we heard from the occupational therapist earlier helping people understand that it's really a whole team effort and so that they have a team at the QEH and you also have a team at home so if there is need for rehabilitation please do your part to help. Uh, we heard from uh, the interventional cardiologist, Dr. Don Scandlebury. You just heard from the nutritionist, uh, Dr. Mar um, Marianne Burnham. I'm, I'm putting a, an additional title, Marianne, so something else for you to add soon. And we also heard from Dr. Kathy Ellis. Thank you all so much for sharing this invaluable information. We look forward to being here and sharing with you next week. We will focus on diabetes and the management of that condition. Thanks so much to our partners uh, in the media and certainly the non-governmental organizations involved in this national uh, effort. Thank you for, for watching. I'm not sure why I'm getting so tongue-tied. I think I still had so many things to talk about, but thanks for watching. Your health, your action. Have a good evening.